Greetings, citizens of the internet. We are back again. And wow, this week was intense. And um, there's always just so much to talk about. But this week, I think I spent a lot of time going through Keith Olbermann clips. Oh, wow. Wow. It's as someone who does not kind of play in the inside the shitlib echo chamber, it's astonishing to hear how these people think. Keith Olbermann still thinks that Trump is going to be indicted for Russia or something. For And he still thinks that he believes honestly that Russia hacked the Democrats and that Putin controls everything. Anything anyone does bad is Putin's control. Anytime anyone cons considers um, criticizing the Ukraine debacle, it's Putin's doing. I mean, these guys give Putin a lot of credit. You would be, you would think that Putin runs everything based on the way these guys talk. So, the first thing I wanted to do this week is another walkthrough of the RussiaGate hoax, and just trying to break it down to the very basics as to why it's garbage and and why it's been disproven. This type of stuff, the way that the press. Uh, did Trump makes him more appealing to a lot of people. I know I like him better now because I know that all the political establishment of both parties hates his guts. And the fact that alone makes me like him. You know, the fact that he's in there and people like Mitt Romney and, you know, Eric Swalwell both hate his guts is great to me. Fantastic. I, do, I don't like either one of them. And they're both Democrats and or Democrat and a Republican. They're both complete hacks who cape for power and do nothing for their constituents. So, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, please. I, I would love to have someone defend Mitt Romney to me. Uh, please do it. Or Swalwell. Oh, my God. I live real close to Adam Schiff's district, another piece of it. Man, the, a guy who, let's be honest, spent the last six years lying just through his teeth at the behest of people who make a lot of money in the cybersecurity business. Isn't that interesting how suddenly Russia is hacking us? We don't quite have proof, but you know, we need to spend a lot of money, a lot of government money to uh, protect ourselves from these threats. It's, it's very interesting, isn't it? So let's start with um, revisiting the Russiagate hoax and let's just, let's just kind of talk about, let's just talk through the, uh, the holes in it. Um, so I started with, um, I have this clip of Chris Hedges talking to Jeff, Ger Jeff Gerth. And now both of these guys are old school, respected reporters. Chris Hedges used to work for the New York Times. I believe Gerth did too. I, maybe it might've been the Washington Post, but these guys are, you know, the OG reporters, the kind of guys who went out and did the research and the interviews and talked to people and collected information. They're not just bloggers who, you know, retweet shit and, you know, repeat other stories from other sources, like most people, do, like I am, to be honest. So both of these guys are well-respected reporters who did the homework, and Jeff Gerst just did this huge piece um, deconstructing Russiagate and all the problems with it in the Columbia Journalism Review, which is the most respected, you know, criticism of journalism there is. Um, and, you know because there's been so much cognitive dissonance around this and so many people have built careers around Trump is a Russian asset, it's not going to break apart real easy. You got guys like David Korn, who I made an awesome video comparing to the band Korn because he wrote an entire book about how Trump colluded with Russia to win the 2016 election, even though it didn't happen. And we're going to go through all the details, but let's start with um, the Steele dossier because... The, the core piece of evidence that Trump Russia gave, the foundational piece of evidence that Trump Russia collusion was built on is the Steele dossier. Okay? There's no other source for these claims. And these claims are all gossip. There's no verified, there's no, they're not documented in any way. Um, in fact, Steele was offered a million dollars by the FBI. This is all documented to corroborate this doc, this dossier, and he couldn't do it. They offered him a million dollars, like, 
if you could get a million dollars, you would think that you would be able to pull the proof out. He was not able to do it. So that tells you something right there. But let's listen to Chris Hedges talk to Jeff Gerth for just a minute about the Steele dossier. Essence, a Russian asset. It began with the so-called Steele dossier. This was financed by the Hillary Clinton campaign. Can you explain what this dossier was? And can you explain why it had, long after it had been discredited by the FBI, such an influence in the press? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Chris. Um, the dossier was actually a combination of reports that uh, started in June of 2016 and lasted till a few weeks uh, before the election, although there was actually another one that came out after the election in, uh, in the fall. And they were compiled by a former uh, MI6 British intelligence uh, agent, uh, Christopher Steele, who in, had been hired by a Fusion GPS, a research firm in Washington, who in turn had been retained by a law firm. Uh, it per- it was then it was Perkins and Cooey. Mark Elias was the uh, the lead lawyer, and he in turn had two clients, the the Clinton campaign and the DNC, who were paying for this. And as as you see by my description, it had a series of layers, so that the the connection between the ultimate work and the ultimate people who are paying for it was was diffuse. So there, there is how it started. Um, Fusion GPS through a Clinton lawyer, Mark Elias and Perkins Cui, sourced this document on behalf of the DNC and the Clinton campaign. So it's opposition research. All right. And this is the source that the press has been using to make this this accusation that Donald Trump is a, is a Russian agent for years. So there's a part up here where Jeff talks about how it was decredited. Was discredited. Only Let's find that and listen to that. Document in the public domain that specifically alleged that there was a conspiracy, as I said, a five year running conspiracy between Trump and the Kremlin. The FBI discredited it pretty quickly, but that didn't dissuade the press from continuing to use it as an authentic mm-hmm. source. No, but, but that's because the, the press wasn't aware that it had been discredited. The press continued, starting with the CNN report uh, in January of 2017 and continuing for many months, the, the press continued to tout the credibility not only of its author, Christopher Steele, but of the contents of the dossier. Even though within weeks of, of receiving the dossier, the, the FBI offered Steele up to a million dollars if he could corroborate it. And he couldn't, and he didn't get the money. In fact, after the David Korn piece came out, the FBI figured out within hours that Steele had been the source. <laughs> David Korn piece? It's like a piece of corn and a turd. For his story and he was terminated as a confidential informant so after david corn from mother jones released that piece they terminated Steele. the fbi terminated Steele as an informant and this was after they offered him a million dollars to corroborate his dossier and he couldn't do it unlike the Steele dossier there's a paper trail behind this so you can trace that mark elias and you know the dnc and all these people paid for this research that they're using to say Trump is a Russian. Listen. And in fact, again, as I point out in the article, in Trump's speech, which was his usual rambling speech when he announced his presidency, he actually mentioned Russia a couple times in a speech in a very aggressive way about how they were a threat and a problem and that we needed more nuclear weapons to deal with Putin. And not one media picked up on his remarks about Russia because nobody was paying attention to Trump, certainly in Russia at that point in time. So he's talking about on the campaign trail before everyone thought Trump was a Russian spy, Trump giving a speech saying we need more nuclear weapons to protect against Putin, which kind of, you know, collides with the accusation that he's a secret Putin spy trying to help Russia. So... um, 
the next little piece I wanted to talk about is the DNC hack because this is another really interesting piece of this puzzle. People think, you know, there was an indictment against like Russian officers or something, which of course they can't respond to because they live in a different country. And unless the Democrats extradite them, they're not going to come over here and go to court on this. So I think they've, you know, probably filed this indictment knowing that these people weren't going to be able to respond. But let's hear what Jeff Girth has to say because there's, they use this, the Democrats use the company called CrowdStrike. And the guy from CrowdStrike said under oath they had no proof that Russia hacked the DNC, but the press never, you know, corrected that. People still believe it. I heard Keith Olbermann talking about it. Not that anyone cares what Keith Olbermann's saying anyway, but... Um, I found this a fascinating point, which I didn't know um, or wasn't aware of, and that is this charge that Trump had gutted the GOP's anti-Russian stance on Ukraine in the party platform, as you write that was... So this is another interesting thing that uh, I heard Keith Olbermann allude to in one of his recent uh, McCarthyist rants about how Trump sold out the, the RNC at the convention. What they say here is basically that's untrue. They had pretty strong Russia... Um, talking points in the platform, but no one bothered to go look it up. Completely incorrect, uh, yeah, but it was picked up and repeated by the press. In fact, of course, they had tightened, called for tightening of sanctions on Russia in the party platform, but that was just picked up and then amplified. You quote uh, Paul Krugman, the New York Times columnist, uh, citing the watering down of the platform, calling Trump the Siberian candidate, Jeffrey Goldberg, the editor of The Atlantic, label Trump a de facto agent of Putin. Um, it, 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 it's, that's the most basic. I mean, it's not that hard to read the party platform, uh, but it kind of is just one of many examples of how uh, anything that could be used to hammer Trump was seized upon, whether it was true or not. So to go back to the DNC hack thing, there's a really good article, which I'll put in the uh, description here by our man Aaron Mate on Real Clear Investigations. And uh, he talks about this guy, what's this guy's name? Something Henry, Scott Henry, Sean Henry. So CrowdStrike President Sean Henry's admission under oath recently declassified December 2017 interview before the House Intelligence Committee raises new questions about whether special counsel Robert Mueller, intelligence officials, and Democrats misled the public. The allegation that Russians stole Democratic Party emails from Hillary Clinton, John Podesta, and others, and then passed them into WikiLeaks helped trigger the FBI's probe into the now debunked claims of a conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russia to steal the 2016 election. So, <laughs> yeah, to us, Aaron... Not to, not to the Keith Olbermans of the world. They still live in the, inside that bubble. The CrowdStrike admissions were released just two months after the Justice Department retreated from its other central claim that Russia meddled in the 26 election, 2016 election when it dropped charges against Russian troll farms it said had been trying to get Trump elected. Sean Henry personally led the remediation and forensics analysis of the dnc server after being warned of a breach in late april 2016 his work was paid for by the dnc so this guy that investigated the claim was paid by the dnc which refused to turn over its server to the fbi asked for the date when the alleged russian hackers stole the data from the dnc server henry testified that crowdstrike did not in fact know if such a theft occurred at all Quote, we did not have concrete evidence that the data was exfiltrated from the DNC. We have indicators that it was exfiltrated, Henry said. So I'm not going to sit and read all these, but you can if you want. But that's another central piece of this that is completely lost on the public. There's no evidence that Russia hacked the DNC, literally none, other than a guy who the DNC paid saying it. So, I mean, if you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you. Um, so, they, Chris and, uh, and Jeff continue to go knock down pillar after pillar of this. They're calling any dissenters pro-Russian and Putin assets. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. 
there's this interview um, that Aaron did with with Jeff. I just want to play a clip of this too, just to to kind of close out this piece. Listen to this. The narrative that that existed. Um, one one of the things that stood out for me was the failure, and of course this is in the piece. It was the failure of the Times in January two thousand and eighteen to report on a, a text that came out from Peter Schrock, the supervisory manager of the FBI investigation. And the reason why I, I find it significant that they failed to report on it while other news organizations did was that this was not some anonymous piece of information. It wasn't information that came from some peripheral source who might be quote familiar with the investigation this was the person running the investigation basically what he's saying is they're lying by omission they're conveniently not covering things that are counter to the narrative they're selling people um and peter strock i don't know if you remember or not was the guy who was a conservatives were losing their shit about because he he said um, you know the t text leak that where he said we were going to make sure that Trump never makes t becomes president or whatever. So for him to say there's nothing there is huge because he already has an anti-Trump bias that we know about, and he's saying hey there's nothing here. All right. So one thing I want to dive deep into because a lot of people ask about it. The indict. What about the indictments? What about there were all these people? The media will say, you know, X amount of people, fifteen people were indicted and arrested around the Trump Russia thing or whatever. I think this article from Vox says there's like sixty five. They you know they really play it up here. Hold on, let me. Here it is. Policy and investigations, and we're gonna go through all of them. So I'll put this article in the description. All of Robert Mueller's indictments and plea deals in the Russia investigation. You ready for this? You prepared for what's about to happen? Let's see what this says here. Um, special counsel Robert Mueller's team indicted or got guilty pleas from 34 people and three companies during their lengthy investigation. So let's walk through these. All right. Number one, George Papadopoulos. He was indicted for lying to the FBI, essentially. A trumped up charge because he misremembered exact dates of a conversation with someone deemed to be connected to the Russian government. Papadopoulos received nothing of note from this person. The person claimed to have information about Hillary Clinton and he was claimed to have met with this person after he was made Trump's campaign manager or a part of the Trump team. And he supposedly met this person so he claimed that he met this person before he knew he was going to be part of the Trump team. And they found out later that he lied and he actually met this person after he already knew he was going to be part of the Trump team. So that's what he was indicted for lying to the FBI about. He, not that he got anything from this person, just that he misremembered the dates that he met with them. So, I mean, he was pardoned, I think, on the way out. Um, and you can read the full indictment. I'll put the link in the in the description. Paul Manafort and Rick Gates were duly indicted for lobbying work they've been doing in Ukraine since 2006. They were lobbying for Yanukovych, former Ukraine president. For they were lobbying Yanukovych for pro-Western interests. So Yanukovych was friendly to Russian interests, and Manafort and Gates were lobbying him on behalf of the West essentially is what was happening and what they got busted for was shady stuff with money laundering the way that they were you know transferring the money around which all these people do and when there's a huge sweeping you know investigation like this they get caught and and made political uh, fodder michael flynn was wiretapped after he was became you know part of tr trump's transition team and when you become part of a transition team like that in politics every transition team does this when you come in you talk to ambassadors from other countries that's what you do so he was talking to kislyak i guess who was the um russian ambassador or i'm pretty sure it was kislyak maybe i'm maybe i'm getting that wrong he was talking to someone who was who worked for the Russian government because that's what you do. 
And the FBI questioned him about that conversation and he, they had wiretapped him and he misremembered some of the details. So they indicted him for lying to the FBI because they entrapped him. This was later thrown out. They, they dropped it. It was government um, misconduct. So completely worthless. <laughs> so the next one here is 13 Russian nationals and three Russian companies. Um, and this... Uh, is what they were just talking about, um, Chris Hedges and and uh, Jeff Gerth, these Russian agents who were never going to come to America. Um, and then you go to the DNC hack, which again, there's no verifiable proof of. It's just a guy the DNC paid saying that he found what they say he found. Um, then there's this guy, Richard Pinedo, who I had never heard of in here. Um, apparently he was helping people. So he has nothing to do. Like they just threw his name in here to, you know, bulk the numbers. He has nothing to do with Trump or anything. This guy was basically helping people launder money using fake identities, like fake IDs and stuff. He probably worked with Manafort and Gates, helping them, you know, smoosh switch their money around when, as they were lo lobbying in the Ukraine. Um, Alex Vanderswan got caught helping Manafort and Gates launder money long before 2016. They say the indictment says up to 2016. It's from this is from 2006 and up to 2016. They don't know that anything happened past 2014 when the government changed. You know, there was a U.S. backed coup. Um, <laughs> and and I'm not just saying that. That's out there. Look up Victoria Newland talking about it. Um, and then number seven is Konstantin, Konstantin Kalimnik. So when I looked him up, apparently he is still on the loose. He's never been um, apprehended by the FBI. So another one of those situations where you have a guy who, you know, was indicted but isn't really able to defend himself or respond to the charges. It's just another guy to add to the list um see the fbi said to he said to have ties to russian intelligence allegedly assisted with a multi-million dollar lobbying campaign in the united states which was allegedly conducted at the direction of the ukrainian government without providing disclosures required by law so to me you know what that sounds like that sounds like what Manafort and Gates were indicted for. He's t he's probably wrapped up in that. And they, you know, they have these, um, what's the word? Uh, just these like vague connections to the Russian government. Like we think he might be con connected to the Russian government. Okay. So there's that one. Number eight is 12 Russian GRU officers, which, you know, they throw these in again. Um, you can lump these into the same category as the, what was the first one? Uh, 13 Russian nationals and Russian companies. And then there's 12 Russian GRU officers. It's like the 12, these 12 Russian GRU officers, 13 Russian nationals in a partridge in a pear tree. All right. Um, so according to the, one of the, one of the things I dug up on this, uh, these Russian intel agents was a piece by Ray McGovern. <laughs> and he, he, one of his comments that I pulled out, I thought was funny. He says, I've been told that later that day, the same grand jury indicted a ham sandwich, but I have not been able to confirm that because you, they're indicting people that are in another country. So it's really like a show indictment at some, because they know that these people aren't coming over here to, to respond to these indictments. So number nine is Michael Cohen. He was indicted for tax fraud and campaign finance violations, nothing related to 2016 or Russia. So there's that one. I mean, that guy was Trump's lawyer for a long time, so I'm sure he was wrapped up in all kinds of stuff. Once they start opening up documents, he cheated on his taxes one year, and you know he did this deal that he didn't necessarily have the right receipts for, and I'm sure they found all kinds of stuff. Um, Roger Stone. Um, here's what Roger Stone's indictment is for. I, it's really weird. Um, so it says Roger Stone 
sent the House Intelligence Committee a letter falsely stating that the person he had referenced in August 2016 was an individual named Randy Credico. Stone then engaged in witness tampering by urging Credico either to corroborate this false account or tell the committee that he could not remember the relevant events to invoke his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination to avoid testifying before the committee. Credico ultimately invoked his Fifth Amendment right in response to the committee's subpoena. So... <laughs> Again, he, li lying, they indicted Roger Stone for lying and witness tampering because they probably had him on wiretap calling the other guy and going like, hey, uh, I don't remember what I said, so just tell him you invoked the fifth so you don't have to say anything because Flynn was indicted or whatever. Who knows? Anyway, the point of, all, of digging into all these is that that's it. All of these are, these guys are, political criminals anyway and i guarantee you if you ran this same comb through the democratic party you'd find all kinds of the same garbage and you could if you wanted to you know go on tv and scream about it and try to like zip it all up into a nice little conspiracy theory you could do it and the icing on this cake the last piece of the russia you know, puzzle here for people who just still true believers is um, this guy, Michael Sussman, who was a Clinton lawyer. <laughs> he got indicted because he actually sold the story to the FBI. And I, I don't remember the details of this, but basically he went to the FBI with the Steele dossier and all this Trump Russia collusion information and said, Hey, I'm coming to you as a concerned citizen, not as a representative of the Clinton campaign. I'm coming to you as a concerned citizen to share all this info with you. And he billed the Clinton campaign for the time he spent doing that. <laughs> so he got busted for that because they're like, wait a minute. You came and told us all this stuff, but you said you weren't working for the Clinton campaign and then you billed them for that time. And, and I mean, that pretty much sums all of this up. What's wild to me is how many people still believe it. I mean, it's not wild to me because a lot of people in the media have been relying on this for years. If you listen to the media, they're still talking about Trump and he hasn't been president for two years. When are you going to criticize Biden? I mean, really the only visible difference between Trump and Biden when, when I when I really think about it is the lack of a press temper tantrum over Biden. It's completely different press environment you know basically the press is just kissing biden's ass where it was with trump every day it was a new scandal you know so um like i said the fact that going through all this stuff and then realizing what a coordinated effort there was amongst all these people against trump makes me like him more it makes me <laughs> makes me go oh damn maybe he was really a threat to the you know the the established power structures in in government and and uh people like fauci who are, are lifers who just you know live in government in federal office and he's an unelected bureaucrat who's been in in federal office for years and years and years and just knows how to work the you know work the uh, levers of power so to speak so on that note we're going to move to our next bit here so one of the things i've noticed is how much the democrats of today resemble the republicans of when i first got into politics when i was a, a democrat who you know was against the iraq war and was happy to vote for obama and change we can believe in and bush is terrible and you know all this this wasteful imperialism we're doing <clears throat> Now, the Democrats are those people. And um, there's this article uh, from Caitlin Johnstone. And she talks about how the Democrats of today are literally the neocons. And she kind of walks through how, um, you know, during the Obama years, there was this kind of transition um, I'll read a little bit of it uh, and then 
put the link in the description, but she says, literally is one of the most misused words in the English language today, but that's not the case with the headline of this article. I'm not claiming here that pro-establishment Democrats are figuratively neocons, and I do not mean to say that they are hella hella kind of sort of like neocons. I say literally because the Democratic Party is now quite literally an overwhelmingly neoconservative party in every way that matters. At the time of this writing, and the time of this writing was... Wow, June 3rd of 2017. Um, at the time of this writing, the so-called March for Truth is currently underway, a demonstration which establishment liberals attempt to leverage Trump's unpopularity with the left to get true leftists and progressives on board with their Russiagate conspiracy theory. The stated goal of the demonstration is to draw attention to their demand for an investigation into the possibility of Trump's collusion with Russia to win the 2016 election, but it's unclear how they plan on bringing more attention to something which already gets unlimited ad nauseum coverage on all media every single day of the motherfucking week. I've heard it speculated that their demands include extending the Rachel Maddow show to six hours in length and adding a day of the week for more Trump Russia coverage. <laughs> As these brave warriors of Mick resistance don their pussy hats and prepare to project their inner childhood wounds upon an icy potato patch on the other side of the planet that they never spend any percentage of their day thinking about until less than a year ago, I'm reminded of an interesting article I read a while back by award-winning investigative journalist, journalist Robert Perry titled The Kagans Are Back, Wars to Follow. Perry details how the most members of the neocon royalty family Kagans moved away from their traditional allies in the Republican Party as Trump knocked them down one by one in the last election cycle and began aligning with Hillary Clinton and liberal hawks whose agendas aligned beautifully with their own. These elites of the neocon think tanks were already pointing their homicidal ideology at full-fledged collaboration with Clinton and plotting ways to bring the liberal base on board with neoconservative foreign policy once Clinton and Trump emerged as the clear presidential front runners. So I'm not going to sit and read this whole article for you, but I wanted to show you just as, as evidence of this, this clip, because I've been watching a lot of old Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert, and there was this clip where... Jon Stewart was talking about Benghazi, and at the very end of it, there's a um, MSNBC star in her original role, so just watch this real quick. What did you say about that? Well, Tom Ridge is a, a good and decent man, entitled to his impressions, but they're just that. And there are some facts that stand between Tom Ridge and a smoking gun. Is former Homeland... That's Nicole Wallace, MSNBC star Nicole Wallace. And so, I, you know, in Googling just to, like, see what she's up to now, <laughs> I found this article about a Ukraine fundraiser she's doing with all these. It's so terrible. I cannot believe it's it's just shit live paradise over here. It's and, and none of these people, you know, these people are so out of touch with reality. A drive through window revelation and pitching the CEO at a buffet. How MSNBC's Nicole Wallace cooked up NBC's Ukraine fundraiser. The special Ukraine answering, answering the call will feature appearances by Paul McCartney, Billie Eilish, John Batiste, Ben Stiller, and others. Wow. Imagine being a rock star and supporting war that kills innocent people on behalf of the U.S. imperial regime. Oh my God. Ugh. Makes me wretch a little bit. It's just, it's, it's really sad. There was a, in fact, <laughs> there's this clip of U2. U2 played in Ukraine and this guy had the most hilarious tweet. Uh, I'm gonna put it up here. I'm gonna find it. I, I'm gonna dig this up just for you guys because it's hilarious. So here you go. So anyway, I wanted to show you that stunning migration of neoconservatives into the Democratic Party. Not stunning at all. I mean, it's been obvious for a long time. But, you know, a lot of my relatives and, and people that I, you know, used to think were critical thinkers, used to believe were critical thinkers, don't understand this and... You know they're they're out there caping for war too. So on that note, let's let's watch. Um, I haven't said much about COVID on this channel because 
I am unsure as to what the rules are around it, and I have a lot of opinions that are probably not going to bode well with the rules or, you know, and maybe the rules have changed. Hopefully they have because a lot of new information has come to light. Um, but I wanted to play a couple of clips in sequence for you because I think they're important to see juxtaposed. We have uh, Rand Paul um, talking about the means for gain of function research. Now, before I play this clip, I also want to say gain of function research, which they're talking about here, which is research that in a, where you teach or like, you know, play with viruses and teach them how to jump species. Basically, this research was banned until Trump. Obama wouldn't allow it. Obama would not approve it. The Obama administration was like, nah, we ain't cool with that. When Trump got in, he's like, ah, oh, deregulate everything. Ah, oh, yeah, I don't care. So he he enabled, you know, his administration enabled gain of function research that Fauci was supposedly funding in Wuhan that they believe now, a lot of people believe created this virus. And I saw the original um, CDC director a few years ago saying, you know, a disease that occurs in nature would have popped up in multiple locations at once because you know not at once but bats migrate so if it if it had come from bats you would have seen multiple patient zeros you know multiple locations where that popped up and it didn't it's traceable to wuhan so that right there to him was a red flag that it's a you know it came from that lab not from nature but anyway let's listen to rand paul this is a real problem and the reason we bring up these amendments on the fire bill, you say, why are you bringing this up on the fire bill? Because we've had no hearings. We haven't had one hearing on this. The other side does not seem to care that probably half the scientific community now thinks this came from the lab. We've done nothing, no hearings on it. But we don't seem to care that we may well have funded this. One of my records requests that I still haven't gotten any Democrat to sign on to, including the chairman, we want to know whether uh, DARPA in our Defense Department or DITRA, DTRA, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, whether they've been funding uh, military research in China, whether they've been funding gain of function research in China that could have led to this outbreak. These are routine government things. We happen to now know that DARPA was asked by the Wuhan Institute of Virology for money to take a coronavirus and insert a furin cleavage site into that coronavirus to make it more transmissible and more infectious for humans. We know that that happened. Why do we know? Not because any Democrat chairman have, asked, or have helped us. A whistleblower from somewhere in the government released that grant. It's a grant proposal. Why in the world we can't see grant proposals? Why we can't see unredacted stuff from HHS? It's not even classified stuff. They're refusing to give us unclassified stuff. So we put forth these amendments, but the response we get is legislative ledger domain. Let's try to hide this so we don't have to appear publicly to be voting against this. Let's vote on a secondary issue so we can try to obscure the fact that we're still in favor of funding Wuhan. We're still in favor of sending money to Wuhan. This administration has allowed the continuation of this. EcoHealth Alliance, who by all sort of estimations have done uh, clearly illegitimate things and really should be forbidden from getting NIH money, just got more NIH money recently. So the thing is, is we've done absolutely nothing. A million Americans died. We've done no hearings on this, not one hearing, and we have gotten no help with getting records. The only records we have from our own government have come from Freedom of Information Act. That's where a federal judge forces our country. We so we're going to bring in Keith Olbermann right now and get his get his take. What do you what do you think he's saying here? What do you, what do you think about Rand's assessment? Allied with Russia and serve Putin. But all of which lines up perfectly with what is being broadcast in Russia, because A, he is a Russian asset, and this is why the probably be described as a Russian asset, putting the ass in Russian asset. And we all know when you see that R after his name, the R stands for Russia. I hope he was paid for this by Putin. I hope he was paid a lot. I hope he can find somewhere to spend it all in hell. Dang. That was... That was intense, Keith. That was very, um... Very thoughtful. 
very thoughtful commentary that you have there on Rand Paul. So I also wanted to show you this footage because there's this illusion in liberal world that Anthony Fauci is such a saint. What a what a saint he is. And you have to live in a revisionist history fairy tale to believe that. And why do you say that? Well, let me tell you, because Fauci has been in the NIH for a long time. And when I was just a little boy, there was this thing called AIDS. Okay, well, you don't believe me, watch this clip, because here is a clip of the, LGBT commu the LGBTQ community protesting Anthony Fauci. You think I'm kidding? Watch this. And I'm pissed, you know? The whole thing with the National Institutes of Health is they won't test any of these drugs that'll keep people alive. And, and I got this saying, no peptide T, no compound Q, Anthony Fauci, I piss on you. We're protesting testing out here in front of the fucking NIH because they cannot, they're not hiding all drugs and they're not coming out with a cure and they're not doing their job. We're talking about their conflict of interest with the pharmaceutical companies. We're talking about the fact that they don't allow people of color in their trials. We're talking about the fact that they don't care about women. They don't care about children. There's a blatant conflict of interest, and this runs rampant through all of NIH. And this is the history of how AZT became the subject of over 80% today of the studies being done by NIH for AIDS treatments. This one drug that's already shown itself to be highly toxic, very expensive, and of, at best, extremely limited effectiveness. So RFK Jr. has a book about Fauci where he goes into this about AZT and how, and I'm not, this is not me saying this. This is, you know, I'm, I'm just repeating what I've read from RFK Jr. And what he says about the way that things worked in the 80s is that the NIH blocked people from getting drugs that they knew would help them so they could sell them pharma drugs like AZT. Now, these are the same people we're supposed to believe have our best interests in mind around COVID. And I'm not saying anything definitively because I don't know, you know, like Jimmy, like Jimmy Dore says, my heart swells with pride when I think about how great the vaccine is. Um, I, 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 I'm agnostic as far as any of this is concerned. I'm just presenting information to you, okay? Because if you think critically and you read into the, the devils in the details and you know how science and medicine are funded in this country, it's a pretty gross thing to look at. So I'm not going to play that whole clip, but I wanted to, that's developing, that's developing. And I, I, I'm glad that we have people like Ron Paul, Ron Paul, Rand Paul, frankly, out here, you know, pushing these kind of things because who else is going to do it? So as we all know, Seymour Horse broke the story about the Nord Stream. And uh, anyway, let, let's play just for a couple minutes, play this uh, this clip of Max and Aaron talking about it. What was the date of the New York Times story, Aaron? It was um, March, March 7th. 7th. Yeah. Okay. So on March 7th, the New York Times introduced the first piece of reporting based on controlled leaks emanating from somewhere in Washington. We assume U.S. intelligence, the White House, or both attempting to present a cover story for the bombing of the Nord Stream pipelines. And this piece, which actually in which the, it required three journalists uh, to acknowledge that they did not have any solid intelligence or concrete <laughs> evidence, blamed a pro-Ukrainian group, let's show the New York Times tweet, breaking news, a pro-Ukrainian group may have carried out the attack on the Nord Stream pipelines last year, intelligence reviewed by U.S. officials suggested. Aaron, uh, what was your reaction to that report and, 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 and how do you view it today, several days later? Well, the key word uh, there, well, there's two key words there. And 
this is a theme of all the Russiagate propaganda that we've called out from the start, is that whenever there's some sort of assertion being made with that they want us to believe, there's always, or almost always, a qualifier that underscores that they actually have no concrete evidence of anything. So right here in that tweet, there's two qualifiers. A pro-Ukrainian group may have carried out the attack <laughs> on the Nord Stream pipelines. Intelligence reviewed by U.S. officials suggested. So that is a clear sign right there that they have zero concrete evidence. And when you go to the story, that's clear because they have nothing. They don't even know who this, pro, this supposed pro-Ukrainian group is. Well, I do. Here you go. Shit jams, doesn't it? <laughs> Aaron just, but that's they. That's what they call him the buzzsaw. Just cuts right to the point. May and suggests, and we just went through the Russia Gate thing. So, you know, Aaron's just that guy's nailing it all day long. Let's bring in Keith Olbermann. Keith Olbermann, what do you think about um, Aaron Mate's commentary, Keith? Allied with Russia and serve Putin. But all of which lines up perfectly with what is being broadcast in Russia, because A, he is a Russian asset, and this is why that probably be described as a Russian asset, putting the ass in Russian asset. And we all know when you see that R after his name, the R stands for Russia. I hope he was paid for this by Putin. I hope he was paid a lot. I hope he can find somewhere to spend it all in hell. Thank you for that very insightful and thoughtful commentary, Keith. We, we appreciate that. Thanks. See you next time. Let's talk now about some protests that are happening. Protests happening in France. Why are these protests happening? Well, basically, Macron wants to raise the retirement age from 62 to 64. You know, they're trying to raise it to 70 here. Anyway, um, so I guess he just did it um, without putting it to parliament or whatever. And this is what happened. Watch this. The French president pushed through a plan to raise the retirement age. Marcus Moore has the very latest. Good morning, Marcus. Lindsay, good morning. A tense days in France and more are expected as thousands of people took to the streets, protesters in the streets of Paris and other cities across the country overnight, setting fires, some of them damaging buildings. And we have seen images of riot police using tear gas to break up those crowds. Police arrested more than 300 people overnight, mostly in Paris. And for a time this morning, protesters were in Paris blocking traffic along the city's ring road. Now, people in that country are upset and are angry about President Emmanuel Macron's a plan that will raise the retirement age from 62 to 64. His government using a special constitutional power to push the measure through without a full vote in the parliament and that has angered even more people now analysts have said that there was a chance that it could be rejected and there was chaos in the national assembly yesterday lawmakers chanting for the prime minister to resign now a majority of the people in france oppose this pension reform plan but president macron has said that if his plan is not implemented that the entire pension system could be at risk but this certainly BS. They can get money from somewhere else. They got plenty of money. We we do too. We do this. Our politicians do this kind of crap all the time. Here's what I think is interesting about this. This clip is from Good Morning America, and the 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 ledger says 
violent protests. So let's watch um let's watch some actual live footage too and see what that looks like cuz I got um I also saw a feed on YouTube that someone was doing someone was actually live at the protest and I watched a few minutes of it and it just, you know, it's you know, this is a different time of day, different part of town, but let's just uh, jump through. So I'll throw the link to this video in the description um, so you can kind of see for yourself. It's, you know, it's like four hours long, so I don't, I doubt you want to sit and watch the whole thing, but it's interesting to kind of click through and see what's going on. And, uh, you know, I see this kind of stuff and it, I, I, I always think about, I had this job a while during when January 6th happened. Um, I was working at this company on Zoom at a tech company, which I won't name. But I, we had a meeting with, um, I had a meeting that morning with a woman from France and a guy from the UK. And I remember getting on the call with them and we started talking and there's, yeah, we saw on, on the news what's going on in the US. And the French woman goes, yeah, it kind of reminds me of the yellow vests, only they're not doing anything. So she was kind of like, yeah, you Americans are pussies. Like the January 6th people didn't even really do anything. I mean, they got inside the Capitol and that was it. Like so, some of them, the, the guys that did stuff, you know, I, there's a picture of a guy carrying a podium or whatever. Yeah, those kind of the people that took things or vandalized or did any of that stuff should, should go to jail. Um, but the idea that it was anything like this or, you know, like a real protest is a joke. And it, it, it was used in the media because everyone was locked at home as this intense event. And again, the media in this country is just so terrible it, and people are so uncritical about it. It's, you know, the January 6th thing is just another great example of, hey, we need something to keep people watching. You know, it, COVID, I think, was very similar. You know, they had they had death counts all day. I, I, I saw when, after after the election, Someone said something about how the last election, someone said, oh, it's interesting how they can do down to the minute death counts on COVID, but we can't count all our ballots in a in a single night, you know, in a couple hours. Like it's it's odd how that works. But uh, with that, I'm going to sign off and uh, hope you all have a great weekend.